Bites, where we carve out space for meaningful conversations that go beyond the grill. I'm Kara Smith, your host and fellow enthusiast for all things tasteful and fulfilling. In this episode, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Joe Gillespie. He has 30 years of expertise in animal health. He's a veterinarian and has a wealth of knowledge coming from private practice and industry. Dr. Joe is going to delve into the intricacies of animal health, cattle health in particular, covering everything from the fundamental reasons behind using vaccines, basic principles of immunology, and just overall welfare practices that we implement in the industry to ensure our wealth or our well-being of cattle. Uh, we'll address some of the common myths, maybe reveal some of the additional truth about vaccines, other health practices, uh, explore how sometimes politics and science intersect in this concept. And throughout the discussion, we're going to demonstrate his exceptional ability to be able to make these complex, convoluted topics more accessible to our audience, providing clear insights into the industry's commitment to cattle health, welfare, and the broader business implications. Welcome, Dr. Joe. Thank you, Kara. Thank you for having me on today. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm excited to, to dive into this topic. Of course, I, I come from a history in ranching, but also a background in animal health, uh, which is where I had the pleasure of, of meeting and working with Dr. Joe. Uh, so I'd love to just start at the high level, you know, within the industry, where do we start when it comes to cattle health and animal welfare, animal well-being? Well, I just first start off with the fact that producers today, not only is ranching and cattle production their way of life, it is what they have a passion for. And so when you have a passion for something, you typically place emphasis on the factors that are most important. And the factors that are most important in overall cattle production is health and well-being of the animals, which you talked, you touched on there at the beginning. It's, it's animal health and well, and well-being. And what do we want with those two things? We want to create a population of animals that are free from disease, free from illness and, and have a quality of life that uh, is important. And when we look at, there's a program across the U S that it's a voluntary program that's put on by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, and it's called Beef Quality Assurance, or BQA. And part of that is a concept that we want to create better husbandry. And that program started in 1990, so a little over 30 years ago. And in that time, we have done two drastic things to the beef industry. One, from a consumer standpoint, we've improved the quality quality of the beef eating experience tremendously. And two, which is just as important, is we have improved the quality of life and, and the quality of the development of those animals that, that, that come into the food supply for you as a meat eating customer. But that's really a, a, a good overview of why we do what we do and help to bring livestock to a better place and in the customers, consumers eating experience to a better place as well. Perfect. Thanks for bringing up the BQA program, Dr. Joe. Uh, as, as you know, but our, our listeners may not know, that was actually where I started in industry. So when I graduated with my, my degree in ruminant nutrition, where we focus on the interface of, of health and cattle nutrition, I started working for the University of Idaho as their beef quality assurance coordinator. Uh, and all of these things became even more near and dear to my heart to make sure that we are not only honoring that animal's life and make sure they have the best life possible, but making sure that, you know, you as a consumer have the best eating experience that you could possibly have with our product. So Dr. Joe, I would like to dive into a piece of keeping cattle healthy, which a piece of you know, the health conversation comes down to vaccines. Um, so could you at a high level, you know, talk through why vaccines exist, you know, maybe kind of where the, the concept came from, why vaccines exist, and essentially what we're trying to do with vaccines? That's a great question, Kara, because vaccines have been 
available to us for not quite, probably 70, 75 years. And the goal for vaccines is to improve health and improve longevity of livestock or, or even us as humans. But in the livestock arena, there's essentially two ways that you can be protected against a particular pathogen. And what a pathogen is, is that's a bacteria or a virus. And there are only two ways that you can be protected to them. One is you get natural exposure. What that means is you, you get exposed to that pathogen. You eat the bacteria, you get, you ingest a virus, you, you take in a virus in your, in your, up in your, up in your nose and it's, it's absorbed into your respiratory system or two, you vaccinate an animal with a, what we call an attenuated virus or bacteria. What that means is it's been altered enough to not make that animal sick. The difference between those two processes is if you get exposed to something, you have the risk of getting very, very sick and even potentially death, uh, which we saw, you know, with COVID SARS virus in the human population in 2020. It's a, it's a great example. Before there was a vaccine, people were getting vaccinated indirectly by natural exposure. But with a vaccine and the development of the vaccines that we have in the cattle industry, the goal behind them is to simply give an animal the ability to recognize a particular pathogen, again, a bacteria or virus. So if they see that in out somewhere in their, their life, that they have the ability to mount an immune response and be protected against it. It's about protecting that animal in the end. And vaccine is a tool that allows that to happen more frequently. Absolutely. Thank you for that high level thought process with it. Uh, maybe let's get into the weeds a little bit for a second on the different types of vaccines. Um, so we, we traditionally have certain types within the cattle industry. Um, you know, you, you brought up, uh, you know, the, the most recent, you know, 2020, all everything that, that happened there um, within that. Can you talk a little bit about how maybe that was a touch different than some of the other vaccines or health challenges, you know, the virus, the bacteria that we normally may come into contact with? Sure. There has not been a case where the SARS virus that we saw in 2020 has been shown or recognized in, in the cattle industry. But what's happened over the years is viruses are, there's different kinds of viruses and there's different reactions of viruses to the process of, of vaccination. Uh, historically, some of the older viruses were DNA viruses. What that means is they very seldomly change. They're very consistent. We take that virus, we create a vaccine that doesn't cause the disease, and then we can give that vaccine and help that animal be protected. We typically booster those vaccines so that their protection will be at a high enough level to protect them annually. On the other side, there is a categorization of modified lot, or excuse me, of RNA viruses. And those are much more difficult. We have vaccines for those, but those are viruses that are changing continually. Uh, in the instance of what people can sort of recognize or understand, the Corona SARS virus was, it is an RNA virus obvious we've had i don't know how many iterations or different types or subtypes of that virus we've had since 2020 so rna viruses are more difficult because they're always changing but in the cattle industry specifically we develop vaccines based on base virus or bacteria that we find and it's a pretty complicated process because it's all approved by the USDA CVM, which is the Center for Veterinary Medicine. And their job is to make sure that a, a pathogen is real first. Second, there's a 
that, that pathogen can cause sickness or disease in an animal. And third, when a vaccine is developed, that that vaccine is able to show that it, if you give that vaccine, the animal has a response to that vaccine, and then you further expose that animal to that disease, that it's protected. That's one thing that doesn't happen as much in human medicine because we're not, we don't, we don't sometimes prove that the vaccines are protected. In animal health, one of the things that actually strengthens the value of those vaccines is as companies, we have to prove that those vaccines are effective against that particular pathogen, which is, which is very important if we're looking at the value that those different products bring and, and how that improves the overall health of the, of the whole livestock population. For sure. So you mentioned the RNA uh, and of course that leads to and has led to a ton of questions within the industry that, that we have, have been addressing of the utilization of mRNA vaccines, particularly in cattle. Could you touch on that, Dr. Joe? Sure. Uh, that's a newer technology and basically today in animal health, particularly in the cattle industry, there are no mRNA vaccines. And the reason, frankly, why, and I, I don't know if that technology works with the particular viruses that we have first. Second, because of the cost of that carrier, so the role of mRNA is to carry that antigen, the pathogen that I talked about earlier, to the body so that it can see that and recognize it and mount an immune response against it. But in the cattle industry, we are looking for our vaccines to do that same thing. But because of us producing a consumable product, and it is a for-profit business for those ranchers, we can't afford to spend the cost that's associated with those types of technologies, typically in animal health. Uh, we are using uh, vaccine carrier or adjuvants as they're frequently called technology that's that's 30 to 50 years old and it's very proven and very safe and it's proven safe and and effective in humans and that's translated into its use in production with livestock after that and so i feel very confident to say that one we're not using an mrna technology two i don't see us using it in the near future uh, because of the cost of that technology. And three, the technologies that we are already utilizing, in particular, the adjuvants that are available in, in, in most livestock vaccines, that technology is very well documented, safe and effective. So if that's not going to change, I, I, very, very, I don't find it very likely that we are going to move to a new technology. And it's going to be a lot like it is in humans, human vaccines change. Many years later, uh, livestock vaccines change if that's something of value. But it's, but at this point, one, they're not there. And two, uh, the technologies that we have are very tried and true. And because of that effectiveness and safety, I feel like that we're gonna continue to use the, tip, the types of technologies that we have today already. For sure. Thank you for that insight. Uh, to the the conversation around, you know, we're we're producing food. Uh, of course, you know, our, our animals they're they're food producing animals. So, what safeguards are put in place to ensure that any whatever animal health products, other things that may be utilized, you know, on on the cattle side, does not ultimately end up in a meat product. So there are very specific regulations within the federal government around uh, whether it be a vaccine which is under the umbrella of the usda cvm which we talked about before or even therapies antibiotics for example those are under the guidance of the food and drug administration and so anytime you're trying to get a product 
uh, developed and approved into the into the food supply, you have to go, go through a tremendous amount of safety and effectiveness studies. So many cases, products that are a new molecule that we discover, and it may be 15 to 20 years before that molecule or vaccine or therapy would come to market. So it's not an overnight process. It's, it's a slow and steady process developed around proving to the Food and Drug Administration and or the USDA CVM that this product is safe. This product is not going to be harmful to the animal and this product is not going to be harmful to humans. And, and harm to humans would be either exposure uh, with the product itself and or uh, the possibility of that product uh, getting into the, or being in the animal at the time that the animal is, is, is uh, slaughtered and processed for food consumption. So there are guidelines that are very strict and very strenuous to make sure that there are no levels of those products in the meat that you're eating. Uh, you know, I, I look at sometimes labels that say antibiotic free. Well, no meat that you buy in the store has antibiotics. Now there are production systems that choose not to, not to utilize antibiotics in that production system. Uh, and I, I understand it, but when as a veterinarian, I feel like the animal well-being welfare is important to me too. And having tools that I can use, therapies that I can use to help with infection, help with disease, those are very important as well. So, but when those are used, we have stringent guidelines to keep animals out of food for certain periods of time. For example, if you might use an antibiotic, which you or I could get any it when we went to the doctor, it, it might be if we use that antibiotic, that animal can't be consumed as food for say 30 days. And we have to strictly follow those guidelines and, and, and routinely at the, at the, at the facilities that process livestock, uh, animals are tested for that uh, to make sure that food is safe. You know, we have globally, we probably have one of the safest uh, food sources anywhere. And that's because of those stringent guidelines set up by the FDA and the USDA CVM. Absolutely. I appreciate you giving a little insight into the process uh, and, and those the different safeguards that are in place that, that may not be as well known. Uh, could you talk to the, the process of bringing these products to market? Uh, maybe a little bit of a, a comparative thought process between bringing new products to market within animal health versus bringing potentially new human products to market. Uh, sure. I, I can't speak exactly to the human side, but I think the process is fairly similar. When a product is developed, it has to first uh, show that there is a, in the laboratory case, that that molecule, whatever that molecule is, uh, is effective against the, the, the bug, if, if you will, that, that we're trying to protect against whether that's to a therapy or that's a immunization with a vaccine. Once they have some idea if that molecule can work, then they begin the process of, of trialing that product. And trial is a process of utilizing that product, in turn, testing those animals for safety and effectiveness and then reporting that information back to whichever regulatory body that's responsible for that particular type of, of vaccine or therapy. Once you have done that on a very, very small scale, maybe that's one to 10 animals, then you go to the next set and that's to 
check and reaffirm safety. And with safety, typically what we do is we give a higher and or lower dose of that particular product to show that it's effective and or that it doesn't cause health risk with animals. And that's in a little bit larger population. And then finally, which is kind of the third stage is on a larger scale to make sure that the product is effective. For example, what would happen in humans is there would be a population that would get the therapy vaccine, which we talked about mainly today. And then there would be another half of the population that would get a placebo or nothing. And, and, and then they would compare those two populations to see how they did, did a percentage, did a higher percentage get this sickness because of whatever pathogen we were worried about versus vaccine and control. So for example, if I was going to say that I was creating a brand new vaccine for some brand new virus, I would give that vaccine to people in the end. And then I would say, okay, how many people that got the vaccine that actually got it? Cause they don't know uh, when they get it, it's a blinded study. So they don't even know if they got the real thing or not. They don't know if they got water placebo or they got the true virus vaccine, but they, the scientists can measure and say, okay, I gave this to a hundred people uh, and a hundred people got the placebo. Nobody got sick. that got the virus and 10 people got sick to that virus that got the, got the placebo. Well, that tells me that there's some effectiveness of that viral vaccine. So that's how that process works. And then once you prove that at the end, then the federal government will give you an approval for that vaccine to use. Uh, sometimes that starts out as a, a, a uh, provisional uh, approval or sort of a temporary approval so that we could prove. And I, I think that's kind of what happened with the Corona SARS virus, uh, but that rarely happens in livestock because they are very, very, very concerned about the safe and safety of the food supply. And, and, and they don't want to, they don't want that food supply to be tainted by whatever product that we're introducing. For sure. To the, the coronavirus, for example, that, uh, that, uh, is, is an interesting thought to me, uh, because Dr. Joe, could you give us a little insight into, you know, we, we have dealt with respiratory coronavirus in cattle for how many years now? 20 or 30 years, okay. probably it's been de slowly developing uh it's not the same virus as what we had with the coronavirus i'll start with that but what is a challenge is it, even though we've been dealing with that particular virus for 20 years we do not have a vaccine for it and there are two reasons that that's the case one is for us to be allowed to develop a new vaccine the federal government has to say that that's a disease at risk and 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 which they have said with the with this coronavirus the second is we have to have a way to give that virus to an animal to cause disease alone so for example it, uh, in livestock typically we have what's called a bovine respiratory disease complex and it's called a complex because there are often times multiple pathogens involved, some virus, some bacteria, different types of bacteria, different types of viruses. So it truly is multifactorial, so lots of components. And so when the animal gets sick, it might not be due to one virus or bacteria. They might be exposed to a virus and then follow that up they get sick with the bacteria and get a respiratory disease so it's complex it's complicated frankly with the coronavirus in particular uh, to make a new vaccine we have to be able to give that coronavirus to an animal make them sick and show the need and and so far we haven't been able to do that successfully re repeatedly so there has been no vaccine created specifically for that and so that just goes to t show you the complex complexity to creating a vaccine. It's not as simple as saying, okay, guys, 
Uh, we had Corona SARS virus in humans. Let's take that technology, stick it in a cow and vaccinate the cow for the same thing. It's not that simple. And frankly, that does not happen. So it's a long, very difficult, lots of regulations, regulations for effectiveness and safety, primarily safety. And if you meet all of those and you can get that to the end where you can show safety and efficacy, that's when new vaccines come to market. For sure. Thanks for, for highlighting that, Dr. Joe. I know we talked about a lot about vaccines. Uh, we touched a little bit on antibiotics. Something that I'd like to hear your perspective on is, you know, us as, as ranchers, as beef producers, um, maybe some of the perceptions that we have in our mind about how on antibiotics work or how they potentially do not work. Like what's you know, at a high level, if we're, we're talking from a consumer of our products, if we treat an animal with an antibiotic, what are our expectations? So when I think about the use of antibiotics, the, the, probably the most common misconception whether that be if I went to the doctor to get antibiotics or I treated one of my cattle is that as soon as I give that antibiotic, I'm guaranteed that that animal is going to respond immediately. But what antibiotics are really doing is supporting our body or our livestock's body, its ability to respond to whatever insult. And that insult can come in the form of virus or bacteria. Antibiotics are only effective against bacteria. Antibiotics, there's two types of antibiotics. Uh, one type causes the bacteria to be killed. One type causes the bacteria to not be able to replicate or reproduce. So they're not wiping everything out. They're helping the cattle's immune system to be able to respond and help itself. So whenever we give any kind of therapy or antibiotic, our goal is not to say that that's going to do the be all end all. It's going to cure everything. It's to support that animal to the level that it can meet the expectation of, of recovery, right? So it can fight off whatever that pathogen is. And the, the premise behind virus vaccines is pretty similar, right? Uh, there's no, uh, we're trying to get the body to mount an immune response initially. So if they see that pathogen later in life, they already know it's not normal and they respond accordingly. And, and, and we do that in s several ways. Uh, you know, if I look at young calves, uh, newborn calves, when they're first born, their first milk is what we call colostrum. And that's filled with immune supportive particles called immunoglobulins that help that calf mount a response if he's exposed to a particular pathogen. And then he develops that later in life, whether that be through vaccine or we talked about natural exposure. But with natural exposure, you have risk of, of severe illness. And so we're doing things in animal health, not to say that there's a big umbrella over the livestock. What we're doing is we're trying to make sure that livestock have the ability to mount a response in the face of a particular bug so that they can have a better quality of life. And that's really the bottom line. We talked when we first started, I, I described BQA, you know, we've done a lot of things in the industry to improve how we approach animals, handling, uh, handling of the vaccines, handling of the livestock in general, all the way to producing better quality product for the end consumer, all with the same goal in mind. We want a healthy animal that will provide a better eating experience for our consumer. Absolutely. So I think that's, a, a good way to round out the conversation as well is we've been talking about these tools that we do utilize to help the immune system increase health, uh, well-being, etc. 
uh, but just touching you know at a high level of all of the other facets that interface with this you know whether it's nutrition stress uh, environment, uh, as you mentioned, even colostrum. So, of course, on Steak Bites, we talk a lot about the, the interface between nutrition and, of course, the product we're producing and how we produce it. But speak, if you'd speak from you know that perspective of all of the other things that we're really focused on in producing cattle, even outside of the technologies we're using, to make sure that we lay that base and then continue from there. Sure. I, I would first start by saying, Kara, and, I, and if most of your listeners can, can think of it this way, it's like a triangle. So there's f- three points to a triangle. In the case of our points, those points are the animal, the stress or the environment, I'll say environment, and then the third is a pathogen. So when I think about health, the stronger the animal is, the less opportunity the environment can negatively impact that animal's health. But I can also tell you that if the impact of environment or the impact of the pathogen are strong enough, they can make any animal sick. So if I look over into the environmental bucket, there's lots of factors. There's stress. There's commingling or putting groups of animals together that haven't spent time together. There is weather. Uh, There's a lot of factors that go into that transportation, uh, all of those things that can play a part in that animal's level of environment influence. Then I get over on the other side with the animal itself. It's does that animal have a, a working immune system? What part does genetics play in that? Did I do a good job of vaccinating it against a pathogen and and it was protected? All of those things are important piece of the puzzle. And then finally the pathogen, and I can tell everybody on this, this podcast today, if I give you enough of a pathogen, I can make you sick. If you ingest E. coli uh, directly in some food that you eat, you're going to get E. coli and you're going to get sick because you've gotten such a load of pathogen. So if that pressure rises, then it changes the dynamic of that triangle. And so our goal with livestock production and in my role in animal health is to make sure there's a balance. I I know uh, Kara, if you're one of Kara's listeners, you know her background in nutrition. Well, nutrition is part of that environment, but I, my goal is to make sure all of those, pieces of the triangle or equal distance apart so that we have a better opportunity for success with a particular animal. And is it always perfect? No, the weather's not always perfect. Uh, the genetics aren't all the same for different breeds of livestock. All those things weigh in. And if we think about it holistically, if I can manage that tri- triangle effectively, I have a better opportunity for more animals to have, have a successful life with well-being and health. Absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Joe. Um, I really appreciate your time today. I, I would love for you to share with the listeners, you know, because this is something that I, I've learned working with veterinarians over, over my years, even just growing up in the industry and then my past in animal health of could you share the, the veterinarian's oath just for the consuming public so they kind of understand the mindset of where a veterinarian is coming from? Sure. I should be able to recite it to you, but uh, as an old guy, you said I have 30 years experience, but uh, it's the oath of veter- a veterinarian or our goal as a veterinarian when we enter this profession is one to do no harm and protect those animals under our care and and simply put we are not only caring about the person that 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 owns that animal we're also uh, by oath our role is to make sure that we care for that particular animal and, and make sure that animal is cared for in a way that 
allows it to have, have quality of life. And that does not matter whether you're visiting your personal small animal veterinarian that is the caretaker for your pet all the way to someone like myself who is the caretaker to livestock that end up being in the food supply which ultimately ends up on your plate and so the 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 oath and the goal is the same and so many cases you know listeners are probably very in tune with their pet veterinarian but the goals and the success of a a food animal veterinarian are very similar at the end of the day. Absolutely. And what I'll add to that is, you know, from a rancher's perspective, from a beef producer's perspective, we, we have that, I'd call it a partnership with our veterinarians. You know, that's, that's the one that is, is there with us to make sure that our animals have the highest quality of life possible. And you as a, a consumer have the highest quality food. Uh, so that's something that we take, very or we have very near and dear to our heart as well so, i appreciate you sharing that dr joe any final thoughts to share with our listeners before we close i just would share one thing Kara, and i just think that consumers need to remember that the, the our goal is to provide you as a consumer with the best quality product and we have tended to improve that drastically over the last 20 years and some of the tools that we use, uh, vaccines in particular, or therapies like antibiotics, their goal is the same. It's not to change the product. It's actually to improve the life of that animal. And when we do that, we improve the quality of that animal, which then ultimately improves the quality of the, the dining or eating experience for, for our consumer. Sure. Thanks, Dr. Joe. So as we wrap up today's episode, let me leave you with some food for thought. Remember, each moment is an opportunity for growth and impact. So stay inspired, stay empowered, and keep fueling your legacy. This is Kara Smith signing off with the Steak Bites podcast.